Hi, I'm Lucy, and this is Pancake. Thank you for joining us for another video, and if this is your first time here, a very warm welcome to you. I think scapegoating is a very big topic because it has a common experience to many people. So why do I say there are so many scapegoats? Well, because whenever you have a dysfunctional family, whenever you have a dysfunctional department at the workplace, whenever you have a dysfunctional church, whenever you have a dysfunctional marriage, then oftentimes people will project onto other people the problems they don't want to look at, the problems they don't want to see. So they'll pick someone as a scapegoat for the difficulties. Well, that can include an awful lot of people. I myself was scapegoated since I was born. And so I understand scapegoating, even beyond the family of origin issues. And the same has happened to a lot of people. The word scapegoat comes from the Old Testament in Leviticus 16 account of when the Levites chose two live goats. One was to be sacrificed, and one was to take all the sins of the Israelites, and then be sent out into the desert. I think William Tyndall was one of the earlier people who coined the word scapegoat, and then it's been used many times thereafter in the more modern era, in psychology, and in family system works. Scapegoating is the glue that holds the family together, that holds the church together, that holds the workplace together, that holds the PTA together. Scapegoating is the important thing that holds it together because the scapegoat is the person that takes all the bad away so that system can function. But sadly, it then ends up there being a scapegoat. They have a distorted view of themselves, the department, the workplace, the family. The narcissist and the narcissistic family all have got this distorted view of themselves. And so we end up with lots of difficulties as a result of scapegoating. So on the one hand, it provides a solution. And on the other hand, it endorses and supports all the problems that are a part of the dysfunctional system. And since I was the scapegoat since I was born, growing up in my family, and throughout my childhood, I was, and still am, considered the scapegoat to them. To them, I was not a person. I wasn't a child. But rather, I ended up being the extensions of my family, and the extensions of my parents. To them, I wasn't me. I was the extension of them because they needed somewhere for the bad to go and they couldn't deal with the bad my family couldn't deal with the bad so they projected that onto me so that then they could have some sort of relief so in my family there's all these different family roles there's the lost child the mascot the golden child, the gold dependent or enabler, and of course, the scapegoat. The chemical dependent parent, for example, doesn't want to deal with the alcoholism or drugs or gambling addiction or infidelity, etc., whatever the case may be. And therefore, the other parent is focused on the parent with the problem. And then everyone's in denial. There are lots of problems and lots of issues. And they had to have a child to focus all of this negativity onto. So then that they didn't have to deal with the negativity. And then a child starts to either act out and starts to act out the role of the scapegoat or the bad one in their eyes and according to them. And then that would usually solve the problem for the family. And they might feel some if anything, temporary relief or start to feel better. 
The scapegoat doesn't, but the family does. They feel much more relief. Scapegoating is a role which is very, very painful. It's confusing and can sometimes even feel maddening. It's a very difficult role to play in the family, particularly as a child. And then it becomes complicated as an adult too, because we carry it on to our adult lives. And sometimes we might wonder why certain things in our lives didn't work out. Well, maybe it's because we've been a scapegoat since we were a child. And the scapegoat lives, if you really think about it, are not supposed to work out. Remember, originally scapegoats were meant to die. And sadly, the same is true when we become adults as a scapegoat. So if you, like me, have survived this long, we've been either very lucky or very blessed or both. And the family payoff is it takes the attention away from their problems and away from where the real problems or the root problems exist. And so this calms the family down while they sent out the scapegoat with all the sins, problems, and projections. And it maintains the equilibrium so that everybody can be stabilized with the family dysfunction. Because when you have a dysfunctional parent or parents or family, it's a lot easier to deal with the kids' bad behavior and punish them and talk to the school and go through all that drama than it is to focus on why they might be having a difficult childhood that they caused in the first place because it keeps the focus away from the root cause. That's what scapegoatism does. It keeps the focus away from the root cause. And then we'll become trenched in that scapegoat role. The dysfunctional family gives a lot of power to the scapegoat because the scapegoat can trigger everyone in the family system. And that's a lot of power. They also give too much power to the golden child. The favoritism and the scapegoatism are two sides of the same coin. It's a projection of the good on one and projection of the bad on the other. And any projection can hurt kids. The golden child also has all kinds of problems because they were projected as the favorite one. Now, of course, they don't have all the negativity the scapegoat has, but they have difficulty knowing who they are, what they want in life, and what they want to do because they have lots of guilt. They have lots of performance anxiety and the conditional love they've been used to. So let's say my father, for example, didn't get help for his depression. Well, then that meant that somebody had to pay for that under function. That had to show up somewhere else. It had to. And then generally, there's a scapegoat. So then you have all of this shifting of blame onto the scapegoat because dad wasn't really getting the help that he needed. So it's got to show up in another way. And so why was I chosen to be the scapegoat and not one of my other siblings? I can only guess it had to do with vulnerability. I was more vulnerable to that, I guess. I was born with health problems, unfortunately. But in a healthy family, that wouldn't have disrupted the family, nor is it a way for the parents to project onto the child that has some problems. And because of my health problems, I was considered and seen as weak. I also had some characteristics that my parents had, 
that they couldn't accept or see them in themselves. So they projected them onto me. For example, I was the one that looked the most like both of my parents. So then I was chosen. Not because I'm the parent, obviously, but because somehow this was projected onto being seen as the parent they didn't like in each other. And so I got to be the scapegoat. Lucky me. So since my parents had obvious limited parenting abilities, and so going through my child life, I needed different parenting. But my parents weren't healthy enough to be able to parent me in a healthy way. Because since they were dysfunctional, and there was narcissism involved in their own family of origin that was a problem for me also I was the scapegoat because I was the only one that questioned the family patterns the dynamics you know like why do mommy and daddy fight all the time etc oh my goodness well those are unmentionables those are things that we were not allowed to talk about in my family because I had just lifted the skirt off the family and got turned into the scapegoat because I was the talker. I was the truth teller. And that was a real problem in my dysfunctional home. And then growing up as an adult, it was still a problem because as I grew, I started to realize how much of a dysfunctional family I had that I had never realized when I was a kid. I had never seen it so severe until I became an adult and I was very uncomfortable with that because I was seeing it for the first time and that's what it felt like and I was seeing it even more and more because before I was just tolerating it that's just the way my family was I would think but it was really very inappropriate and really wrong and hard to be around them but we always just did it that way because that's what you do you just tolerate families well no i came to find out because families that are dysfunctional are in denial and they don't see anything wrong with that with what they're doing so i would just be told that i just needed to be tolerant of them I needed to accept this as just the way families are. Yes, but I don't know if I want to be around somebody that's inappropriate. Because that's just not okay for me. It's not anyway. And so, since I started seeing things in a different way, in a way that was not okay, that, again, reinforced the scapegoat role. And I was in a scapegoat role for sure growing up. And so as the scapegoat child, I was the whistleblower. I reminded them of someone they were either hurt by or didn't like or that had rejected them at some time. And certainly, since I had a narcissistic family, there had to be someone to shed the shame onto. And as the scapegoat, my narcissistic family felt they were in control and very powerful. And therefore, I was unwillingly and unknowingly providing their narcissistic supply as the scapegoat. I was the easiest target for their manipulation, the self-righteousness, the aggression, and even the violence. I was just the easiest target. I was the easiest for them to gaslight. I was the easiest one for them to abuse. And so I got in trouble for that too because I didn't go along with the program, which they couldn't tolerate that, which they had then labeled me as a difficult child because to them I brought out their inadequacies and also because they labeled me the sickly baby or sickly infant. Again, it wasn't because I was sick. They just labeled me the sickly kid, and that was a problem for them 
because that made me the bad kid of the family. I, like other scapegoats, lived in the family trance, the family brainwashing, the family programming. I was programmed to see myself as the problem, and that's one of the most insidious lies and one of the most difficult lies there are. And it is what they wanted me to believe. So as the scapegoat, I carried the family pain inside of me, the negative traits that got projected onto me. So if I buy into that from their brainwashing and from my cult-like existence growing up, then that becomes painful and then you need someone else's objectivity to say, now wait a minute, that's not okay. Your family's not right about that. So my family's traumas were projected onto me. The hurts got projected onto me as the scapegoat. So I guess everybody in my family was normal except for me, the scapegoat, even though everybody was seeing the same thing I was seeing, hearing the same things I was hearing. But as the scapegoat, they needed to reject me and they had to exile me just like the scapegoat in the desert. So I could just go away with all of their problems so that they wouldn't have to deal with them. So then I wouldn't get invited to family functions or holidays because they didn't like me for speaking the truth and trying to get help. I was dehumanized. I ended up not being a person. I was to them too sensitive. I was defective. And I was unlovable. And all those things were projected onto me when none of it was true. Yes, I have my own imperfections like everyone else, but being seen through those lenses, not as a person and in the family scapegoat role, you're only seen as bad, just as the golden child is only seen as good. And both are distortions and both are a lie. So as they made me the scapegoat, my role in my family was to take total and sole responsibility for the relationships. This is one of the cult-like traits in the family. So it was my fault they weren't getting along. It was my fault they had problems. It was all my fault. They weren't doing anything wrong. I always felt like I was navigating a minefield. When was I going to step on a mine? When was I going to step on an explosion? When was I going to do the wrong thing? Because the scapegoatism and the projection and the negativity is not done out of a rational thinking process. It just blows up in different ways. It just blows up like standing on a mine. When I would think everything was okay, and then all of a sudden I was told I was bad, I was treated unfairly, and I would be left wondering, what did I do wrong? What went on? What just happened? But my family needed me to be the scapegoat. It wasn't about reality. It was about what they needed. So since I was the scapegoat, I would be the one to get punished. I would be the one they would see as negative. They couldn't deal with their anger. So that was projected onto me. So in my need to calm everyone down so that they would feel better and to fulfill my role of the scapegoat, all of the bad went out with me. And so they didn't have to look at our family dysfunction. They didn't have to look at their pain. They didn't have to deal with their feelings or their anger or their unhappiness and all of their mess. My family needed to deal with their stuff so it wouldn't get shifted over to me, but they didn't. So I got selected because I was the empathetic one, the most understanding one. 
I was the most easily to beat down, to gaslight, and to be lied to in my family. When actually it was my family that couldn't stand up for what they needed to do. So what did I do? First of all, I recognized I was my family's scapegoat and that it was not my fault. It was never my fault. And that it all started making sense why I had been chosen to be the scapegoat. I had to learn that it wasn't me. It was the root of it. I've had to learn to deprogram myself in terms of learning about codependency. And it has helped me tremendously in healing. I had to learn how to stabilize how I saw my family because I didn't always have a clear understanding of my family because it was muddy, it was fuzzy, it was hazy because I was stuck in that family glue. I was stuck in the family enmeshment and it was just hard to see through the, all that fog and all that programming that I had been programmed since I was born. It was very hard to see my family clearly. It was like learning how to get out of a cult. Then I had to stabilize how I saw myself. I had to tell myself and realize now, wait a minute, yes, I'm not perfect. Yes, I've made mistakes, but I'm not deserving of being abused. I'm really not, and this was wrong, and it wasn't my fault. I am a very loving and caring person. I'm just not going to continue loving and caring about abusive people. I have lots more empathy than my family ever had with me or to me. So if that makes me bad, which it doesn't, then so be it. And in whose eyes anyway? And then I had to give myself permission to step away. I needed to get some objectivity by removing myself and learning to go little to no contact with them and not allowing any one of them to cross my boundaries again. I also had to learn to de refrain from defending myself. I realized it was not going to do me any good for the years I had to defend myself from my family. I realized it wasn't going to change their views. I wished it would have, and I wished things would have been different, but it's not about the logic of it. It's what they needed me to be, and that's really delusional. It's unconscious, and it's not about the truth because they're not interested in the truth. So talking them through that so that they'll see it doesn't do any good at all. It would only make me more of a scapegoat. And that's another thing I had to learn to do was refraining from trying to change them because it was only going to frustrate me and reinforce the scapegoat role. I also had to stop myself from trying to change myself to change them. That was also going to reinforce the scapegoat rule too and I was only going to be bending and pretzeling myself so that somehow they would see me differently. Because with every pretzeling and changing they would only counter that with still wanting and needing to see me as the scapegoat. They needed me to be the scapegoat. I wanted to change for myself, not for them. And very importantly, I had to learn to grieve the loss of my family and of the family I had always wanted, like the normal family I always wanted. Because I learned that if I only dreamed about it, my dreams were going to get dashed and broken. So grieving that loss really did help free me inside. And what also helped me was I went back and confronted and resolved the feelings and events of my childhood and the scapegoating. I did all this not by confronting them. That 
would have been a waste of my time and I don't recommend that to anyone. But I do it and I still do it through journaling. I write my feelings in letters which I never send to them. Afterwards, after I get everything out, I always burn my letters. I vlog here on my YouTube channel like I am doing right now. I've worked with therapists in the past to help me work through this. And I have found a lot of freedom doing that and deprogramming myself from this cult-like trance. I needed to get help so that I didn't continue to fulfill the scapegoat role. I also learned to lean on a circle of support. Like, for example, I started my own social media group for emotional support. I had to learn to do self-differentiating, which was and has provided me with a new or a genuine self to move forward with. I've had to learn to let go of the need for validation because I was always yearning for that validation because I didn't have any of it when I was young. I let go of that need for it and learned, hey, I can let that go. I may feel abandoned, but I'll deal with my abandonment because I don't need them to validate me. Because if I would have waited for that, I would have probably waited a lifetime before that would happen. Because they still needed me to be the scapegoat. They couldn't validate me and they're not going to validate me. Because that would mess up their whole system and they would all come tumbling down. And I had to learn to challenge myself to think about the way I thought of myself. I had to learn to help myself. Because I realized no one else was going to do it for me. And I had to learn to rescue myself because I also realized there was no one coming to rescue me.